I want to thank everybody. Um, I'd like to try to stay on time. We have a lot to cover, and I know everybody's time is precious, especially on a Friday before Thanksgiving. I hope everybody's trying to get out of here. Um, I really, really appreciate everybody spending four hours on Friday afternoon here. It's incredibly exciting to have this many decision makers and leaders of human services all under one roof. I'm very excited that we're all here to share today. Um, my name is Michelle Parks. I work for Child Care Resources. I am the chair of the um, community management team. A little bit of history of community management team. It was brought forth um, when we were developing the one-stop system here in Missoula. We, we tried to serve Missoula and Mineral County with this group. Mineral County doesn't have a lot of um, participation, but they're always welcome. We uh, have kind of seen them come and go depending on the needs of the community. As you can see from your agenda in your packet, we have several um, regular members that are on the, the right side, or the left side of your page. We are very excited that we have this raw volunteer group. We tend to get together on a regular basis and visit. It's important to know what everybody's doing. It's a great opportunity to network, and it's also a great opportunity to figure out how to collaborate on um, funding opportunities. So with that being said, I'd like to run through and do introductions. Um, we'll start over here with Linda and move around the room. How about that? Well, I'm Linda Gessner. I'm the supervisor at the Missoula Office of Public Assistance. I'm Kelly Rosalief. I'm the director of Child Care Resources. Mike Flaherty. I'm with Community Medical and specifically representing the, the work center component of our outpatient services. I'm Maggie Driscoll, Driscoll with District 11 Human Resource Council. Uh, I'm Jim Morton with Human Resource Council. I'm Renee Bentham. I'm with Missoula County Public Schools Adult Basic Education Program. I'm Gary Gilbert with Experience Works. Sandra Long from the Missoula Job Service. Naomi Lightson, I'm the Acting Case Manager for REO and Mr. Montana. I'm Bruce Day. I'm the Executive Director for REO. I'm I'm Jenny Graham. I'm the Communications Director for the City of Missoula, and I'm here representing the Mayor. Sue Wilkins. I'm the Executive Director of Missoula Correctional Services. I'm Jack Chambers. I'm the CEO at Opportunity Resources. I'm Lynn Stocky. I'm the Associate Dean at the University of Montana College of Technology. Alex Apostle, Superintendent of Missoula County Public Schools. Tony Portman, the Director of the Adult Education Division for Missoula County Public Schools. Janet Van Dyke, Regional Administrator of Vocational Rehabilitation. Uh, and Dale Addis, uh, Program Manager for Mind and Vision Services. Chris Holmes, I'm the Associate Director of the YWCA. Wolfgang Ovitz, Bichler Manager of the Missoula Job Service. Naomi Thornton, I'm a Program Director of Women's Opportunity and Resource Development. I'm Kelly Dagger, the manager of the Job Service Palmer Street. We work with the Work F Snap It excuse me, programs. Thank you. We'll start with Wolf here, and we'll go around, and you can kind of break the ice and kind of give everybody an idea what we're looking for. Break the ice. Yes. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, before I get started on what our organization is currently occupied with, uh, I wanted to say a couple of things because we see a lot of new faces here. We have had a community management team in this community for a number of years. All the organizations that are here have been represented on that community management team in one form or another, either directly, such as Mo or myself um, or Kelly, or through your staff. Uh, in the past, we had a mix of uh, staff members and leadership in a community management team represented. We've done some activities that revolved around cross-training uh, to make sure that our various organizations know what we do and how we can tie into each other's networks for the benefit of our joint customers that we have. Uh, it's a bewildering network of organizations out there that are trying to help. And for a consumer, it's sometimes very difficult to navigate through that network. And uh, the establishment of a community management team was intended 
to uh, at least alleviate that problem. So the first target was we educate our organizations and ourselves as, what, as to what is out there, and then we pass that knowledge on in our case management activities uh, for the benefit of our customers. Everybody walks in and gets to introduce themselves. Oh, excellent. Good. Hi, my name is Andrea Davis. I'm the executive director of Homeward. And I apologize for being late. Thank you, Andrea. <coughs> Thank well, you very much. We have Jody Rasmussen. Rasmussen. Jody Rasmussen. I'm Jody Rasmussen. I'm Jody Rasmussen. I'm Jody Rasmussen. I'm Jody Rasmussen. That, that kind of mix worked really well for some time. And we had discussion via a small core group of the CMT, what, what is kind of the next step for the CMT? And uh, we came up with this idea for a human services leadership summit. Uh, something that might happen two or three times a year, and the idea was not to go over again and again what it is that we all do in detail, but rather, what are our respective bigger issues? What are we struggling with in this particular economic environment? Um, what are we gearing up for? What new initiatives, grants, et cetera, are we working on? And how are our organizations changing along with it? Tamara, you get to introduce yourself, too. I'm Tamara, and I'm from the Housing Authority. Thank you. So uh, this is the first attempt to put a forum like this together and get some idea of um, you know, what, what are some of the overriding issues for each organization and how can we jointly help to address maybe an individual um, organization's issues besides being supportive in grant writing opportunities, et cetera. In other words, how can we strengthen the collaboration between those organizations? Um, we're not saying that this is continuing. That's a decision that's really left up for this group. The second part of the day, we also want to throw out uh, the possibility of setting up a second network that is almost exclusively made up of our respective staffs to continue training efforts at that case management or at that worker level and make sure that at the line staff uh, level within each organization, people know about what all is out there. Uh, we're all drowning, I think, in customers right now that need a variety of services. And it's sometimes, even for the professionals in this room, it's bewildering what all is out there. And anything we can do to help train uh, our staff and ourselves is probably going to benefit our community quite a bit. So we'll go into that as a part of the second session. And uh, one last thing before I get started on our place, and I'll keep that part short. I really want to thank the organization of um, adult education, Mo and her staff. They've done a tremendous job in helping put this together. And uh, St. Pat's has been very gracious in making this room available. And again, uh, being supportive of that. Job service, um, for those of you that don't know what we do in a nutshell, we try to match job seekers with businesses. Uh, that's our bread and butter. We do a lot of that on an automated basis. We do not file claims for people, uh, unemployment claims, although there's still a misconception that we do. Uh, we haven't filed a claim in more than 10 years. It's been just about 12 years since we've done that. Uh, we are shifting more and more over to uh, human resource consulting, workforce consulting, and we have a variety of workforce training programs that kick in mostly during layoff situations. And here we are. Uh, we are busier than ever. Right now, we're running about, on a quiet day, 350 people through our doors uh, on between 7.30 and 5 o'clock. Not everybody's unemployed, but a lot of those folks are unemployed. Uh, so we're, we're experiencing a tremendous workload of people that come in through based on layoffs. We also do quite a bit of outreach. Uh, we have recently, with our partners from Adult Education, been up in St. Regis. Uh, the Tricon Timberville experienced a layoff of roughly 40 folks, and it's not looking real good. Uh, Stone Container, same thing, Pyramid Mountain, Lumber, uh, Plum Creek, et cetera, et cetera. It just goes on and on. What we try to offer people is, um, besides the immediate uh, unemployment insurance piece. 
we try to make the transition into a possibly new career as easy as possible. Um, quite frankly, being in the timber industry is probably not a growth path right now, although uh, I'm sure it will be kicking up again uh, to some degree, but uh, we have experienced really over the last 20, 30 years a gradual downsizing of the timber industry in western Montana. Where uh, workforce training programs are very helpful is to work with people and say you might want to consider an alternative career. And uh, there is quite a bit of funding available to help with that transition to get people there. And what's key for us is really to be able to work with the educational system and the partners we have there. Uh, a, a very healthy portion of people that have been laid off and are in retraining uh, start their next career with the Adult Learning Center and then from there on out, typically with the College of Technology. There are some very rich programs out there uh, where people basically get two years of, of full scholarship, uh, full ride scholarship, and two years of extended <coughs> employment benefits if they qualify for that. Um, it's a good, healthy way of doing that. We have migrated and continue to migrate more and more to automating our services. Uh, there are a lot of job boards out there. We are one of them. We're posting every single job that's out there on the net now. Uh, that allows us to uh, keep the actual walk-in traffic low. And for the Generation X, Generation Y folks, that is the preferred way of doing business. So that's working pretty well. Um, we get several thousand hits on the on the website, and these are people that used to come in the office. So that part is working extremely well, thanks to Sandra, who's kind of our technical guru, doing that. Our biggest issues now is dealing with the economic slowdown, and it's probably going to get worse before it'll get better. Uh, I've included in the packet. Uh, something that just came out today, an economic go-around, it gives you a very brief, uh, concise picture from a variety of communities around Montana. Uh, who's growing, who's not growing, what's going on. And uh, if you put that puzzle together, I think you will find that Western Montana is probably hurting more than the rest of the states in many ways, up until the Stillwater Mine had a major layoff. Um, for those that don't know, there are 500 plus workers laid off at Stillwater Mining uh, in the Columbus area. Uh, the, the flip part of it is we're getting fewer and fewer staff, like everybody else. Uh, life has not been good to us when it came to federal funding or state funding. So again, we are forced, and we'll probably hear this a lot today, we are forced to do more with less and automation is starting to be a big part of that. And with that, I'm probably out of time, right? Thank you. Um, Naomi Thornton again with uh, Women's Opportunity and Resource Development Word, as most people know it. And um, Naomi, can you speak? Okay. Or maybe stand up. <coughs> Would you like to be one? <laughs> Um, Word has been around for 22 years now, so it's a very um, uh, grassroots organization in the way that it started, but it certainly has grown over the years. It has um, a large budget now and does a variety of things. And um, the mission of Word is to create opportunities and programs that support women's um, leadership development and choice uh, for the benefit of the whole community. So. Um, Word, our new executive director is Bonnie Buckingham, and she'll be joining us um, later. So, um, Word works with many of Missoula's families that probably have the least resources. So, Word has um, a number of programs that primarily work with homeless families or families that have a lot of um, housing instability. We have a program that works with young parents, um, the majority of whom in the program um, are high school dropouts. So. We're very interested in linking people to all of the workforce development and other services in Missoula and, um, and feel that we can serve a very critical role with that. Um, in the past, Word has had more programming um, that um, could actually provide more things. We had the Gearing Up program, which actually provided training. And uh, two years ago, we lost kind of our final bit of um, funding for, for that program. Um, right now we do have a 
a program for young fathers that's very focused on economic stability. Also, um, we're really, I think, throughout our history has really seen education and training as the key factors that move people forward out of poverty. So we've had a really strong commitment to that and a commitment to this group, I think, in, in really being um, up, to, uh, up to date on what is available in the community. We feel like that's an important role that we can play. Um, about some things to celebrate, it's, it's said in the, um, the handout. So some things are, we do have a new executive director uh, right now, uh, Bonnie Buckingham came on in the summer and we have a development director and a lot of ways we feel like Word is really positioned to move forward on a lot of things. We've done a lot of great work I think over the past um, couple of years. We're in the, our, the final year of a, a strategic, our, a three year strategic plan and we're currently doing a needs assessment of um, women's needs in Missoula and we have a great uh, VISTA um, volunteer who is working on that and we'll, we'll have those results probably I would say sometime in the beginning of the new year and we'll be able to share those um, results um, with all of you. And she's done focus groups and interviews with um, close to 200 um, women in Missoula. So um, those are some things that we're working on that we're excited about. Also the fact that um, some people still don't know, but we moved from the downtown area about two years ago. It would be just about two years and we're in the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, um, which is a great space, and it's been a good move for us. Um, and But at the same time, it seemed so big when we moved in, and now we are just completely out of space. And so even looking at some things that we would like to expand, we're kind of facing, you know, where, you know we don't have space to even bring <coughs> students on to help out and things like that. We, as many of you probably will say the same thing, we are seeing more people all the time, our, um, like the Futures Program, which serves young parents, we saw over the past two years, we, we saw close to a 50% increase in the people that we're seeing in the program. So we're definitely seeing more people come in, coming in. Also, we're, we continue to get a lot of calls um, from people looking for things that we can't provide, and there seem to be some gaps in, in the community as well. So a lot of women calling and wanting training and different things, or that we can't necessarily offer due to like the you know grants restrictions on who we're serving in particular programs. So um, those are kind of the things that we're at. I think that the challenges that we're facing, I think again we're just seeing more people coming coming in, and our interest in, is in um, connecting people to employment opportunities and to education and training. So very important for us to be up to date on what everybody in this room is doing, so thank you. We have a couple of people join us and <coughs> you want to introduce themselves. Pardon me? Would you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm sorry, I'm late. I'm Jude Munson from Summit Independent Living Center. Uh, we've been in uh, this area for 27 years. Um, I'm Kathy Dutton with Council Grove Apartments and this is Sarah Hughes, also from Council Grove Apartments. We're a low income housing community on South 3rd. Well, um, my name is Kelly Deniger and I am the manager of this the Job Service Work Program and we used to be a part of the, the job service on 3rd Street and uh, our administration decided that to, to split us off so we're totally separate. We are totally dependent upon funding from Department of Health and Human Services to operate the programs. There's three primary <coughs> programs that we operate. One is, is the WORK program, which deals with people that are receiving TANF, the Temporary Assistance for, for Needy Families, which the old verbiage people understand is welfare. Um, we deal with the SNAP IT program, which just recently changed name, it used to be the food stamp program. So people that are receiving food stamps, um, we provide employment training piece for them. We also have another program called the Family Economic Security Program, where we work to, uh, to help people that have received TANF in the last five years get either further training or education to help them become more self-sufficient, to help them be able to make it in the world rather than living in poverty. <coughs> so we are totally dependent upon the Department of Health and Human Services for our funding. They're usually uh, up for bid every three years. We've been successful for the last 10 years in, in achieving that. Um, 
for most of our programs, there are referral or closed shop, meaning everybody comes from the Office of Public Assistance. So people just can't walk in off the streets and be eligible for our programs, with the exception of the Family Economic and Security Program, that they've had to receive TANF within the last five years. Um, it's, it's been challenging. Uh, we had, at one time, we had, uh, in our heyday, we had 25 employees in our office. We're down to 13. And for the most part, that's a reflection of the caseload reduction, which is really good. You, you would think, oh, that's great. You know, the caseloads have gone down, and 10 caseloads have gone down pretty dramatically over the last 10 years, um, which is good that people are on TANF, but the bad part is, is that the eligibility number is so low that you really don't, you can't be making any money at all to be eligible for TANF. I mean, there's, it doesn't take much to not be eligible because you're just working at all and you're not going to be eligible for it. Um, with that comes a lot of different, I mean, we used to be able to do a lot of different things with our folks because we had the staff to do it. We, we, we don't. Also, the rules for TANF have become a lot more restrictive than they had in the past. So we, we used to have this huge box to operate from, and now our, we've got a little narrow box, which actually has opened up with um, this last July and this last October. So it's opening up a little bit. It, it seems like the pendulum goes way over here, then we're starting to come back towards a little of it, which we are very thankful for, because we just would like a little bit more wiggle room to work with our participants with. Um, it is, our, our, our primary challenge is, again, finding the staff to be able to deal with the, uh, the barriers that, that our folks have. And when I say I've got very educated staff, but the caseloads keep creeping up there, um, particularly with our, our they changed the, the food stamp name to SNAP it recently, and I'll never forget, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance program. Assistance program. So if you hear somebody talk about SNAP and student food stamps, that's that's what it is. So it'll take me another 10 years to get used to that acronym. <laughs> <laughs> Those numbers are phenomenal. I mean, I've got two case managers for that. because That's all I can afford. I can't afford anymore. They have case loads of upwards of um, 80 people a piece right at this point in time. Pretty difficult to see them every week and do anything that is even close to case management, employment training activities when you have, when they're seen as much as they are. So um, it's very, it's been a challenge. We, I don't anticipate that it's gonna get any better. Um, with our TANF population, we're not seeing a huge increase in that with all the different economic downturn because if they're eligible, if people are eligible for unemployment, it's not until they exhaust their unemployment that they're gonna be eligible for the TANF program. So we anticipate that that'll probably be an increase down the road. And also with the lessening of some of the restrictions that we have with that. I think the bright spot in, in our office right now is the Family Economic Security Program. It is a special grant. There's seven statewide um, that we have from, that we wrote and got from the Department of Health and Human Services where we can put people in training, short-term training. We've done a lot with, um, with again, Dickinson um, Lifelong Learning Center with their medical classes, the dental assistant classes, um, to help people get that some of that short-term training that's going to put in the jobs that are more um, likely to be able to support their family, the career type positions. So we, we absolutely love that program. Um, and we hope it, it ends uh, June of, of 2009, so we're hoping that it will be renewed. Um, it, it's tough. It's tough for everybody. We deal with most all, all of your agencies at one point or another because, of course, uh, when they're when they're on TANF, that they, they just have they have no resources. So, well, my name is Linda Gessner. I'm a supervisor at the Missoula Office of Public Assistance, and I'm standing in for my boss, the County Director Chris Mitchell. She's out of the office today. Um, the State Department of uh, Health and Human Services administers a number of programs to assist low-income individuals to become self-sufficient. And um, Kelly was just talking about the SNAP program. Um, the federal government has changed the name on that. A lot of states aren't changing it. They're still using food stamps, but Montana decided to go with Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. <laughs> And this is to pro provide for the nutritional needs of low-income individuals and families. 
Uh, we also administer um, many different Medicaid programs to assist folks with or families, pregnant uh, ladies, um, age blind and disabled individuals with their medical needs. And then we have the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, or TANF, and that's a cash assistance program, and it's time limited to 60 months per lifetime per household. Um, our office's ultimate goal is to respectfully serve everyone who seeks our assistance in a timely and accurate manner, and to make accessibility to the benefits we provide as uncomplicated as possible. And to do this, we are striving for, uh, with the SNAP program, we're no longer required to have face-to-face -face interviews. We can do phone interviews, so we're really utilizing that to make accessibility more to everyone. And with the Medicaid program, the interviews are not required. So the only requirement to come in and do an actual face-to-face -face interview in our office is with the TANF program. Um, our successes, well, even though the volume of applications that we receive is just increasing <coughs> dramatically, we usually have a downswing. We didn't see that this year, and now with the economic state, um, particularly with SNAP and Medicaid applications, we're averaging about 45 a day just in our office so that's just tremendous to try to get all that going we are seeing a lot of uh, parents obtaining employment and achieving success in that area which reduces our TANF population or households unfortunately even though they're finding employment they're still not finding sufficient employment to be totally self-sufficient. So like I said, the SNAP and the Medicaid applications are just streaming in. Um, for the big picture, we're working on what's called shared caseloads. It has some aspects of the, the call centers. What we're looking at, we're just in the planning stage right now. Um, part of the staff being in intake and part being maintenance. So we would just have so many of the adult caseload or caseworkers and so many family workers uh, would just work all of the maintenance cases and then the other would do intake. We've done research so far with other uh, offices of public assistance around the state that have tried this or are doing it right now and it seems to be working really well for our customers and for the offices. So hopefully that will work and maybe we can start in as soon as March. Um, we're also working on a, a program for Medicaid, especially with HIPAA, we had to separate the Medicaid out. It's called CHIMES and that stands for Combined Healthcare Information and Montana Eligibility System. <laughs> We have an inflammation date of July of 2009, and this should really assist with, well, our team's program was implemented in 1992, so you can imagine how outdated that is. So hopefully that will get started, and also um, after that's done, we're looking at a paperless offices. We're going to hopefully get scanners and not have all the file cabinets and you know, trying to find different files for people and things like that. So we're looking forward to it. We think it will work good. <laughs> I'm Kelly Rosalie, the Director of Child Care Resources. We work in Missoula, Mineral, and River Valley counties. Um, we are a leader in early uh, childhood care and education. We promote high quality and accessible services to support and strengthen children, families, and communities. And to that end, we offer the following services. The first one is referrals to child care. We help link families who need child care to child care facilities that have vacancies for that age of child and the schedule that that family needs it in the community that they need that care. So we maintain a database and update that regularly and, and that is a free service that is available to anyone. It's not a needs-based service. We certainly do it a lot with um, lower income families on our scholarship caseload, but we do it a lot with uh, folks. I think in general people will use it um, as with any professional service, um, 
you know, you ask your friend where they use childcare, and you see if you can go there like you might for a doctor or a dentist or something. But when that breaks down and people can't find childcare on their own, then um, then they often come to us for that help. Um, and uh, our largest program is the Child Care Scholarship Program. Uh, we serve somewhere in the neighborhood of 900 children a month in the three county region. Um, and we uh, pay, well, we the government pays <laughs> for the cost of uh, most or a portion of the child care for that family if they are 150% of the federal poverty level or below. So for a family of three, that's about uh, 20, $3,500. It's about one person working, twelve sixty nine an hour. Let's figure this out for a high school class. So um, you can have a pretty good job and still not be able to afford child care for two children. And um, they'll have to pay about um, $200 a month then towards their child care. We recently got a federal report. Montana has the seventh highest child care costs in the nation. And you know we do not have the seventh highest wages in the nation. So, um, so this is a program that is mostly federally funded, has some state funds involved in it, um, and that funding at the federal level has been flat for the past eight years, and we can hopefully hope for better in the future. Um, we also <coughs> offer training and technical assistance to the early childhood workforce, so for all child care providers in this region, we offer all kinds of workshops. We're moving to more intensive, um, comprehensive curriculums, because that's the kind of stuff that actually results in change. Um, and change practice, and so we're doing more and more of that. Um, we do individualized technical assistance on site with facilities to address specific kinds of challenges they might have um, and needs that they might have in their programs. Then we um, administer a federal nutrition program, the child care food program, and it offers meal reimbursements to child care facilities that meet the uh, Department of Agriculture's definition of a nutritious meal and don't even get me started on what that is. <laughs> it's not my definition of a nutritious meal. And that is open for reauthorization, so I have commented that I don't think Pop-Tarts should be allowed. Um, <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> that's a little challenge there, so that's a health food. Um, so in terms of challenges that we face right now, just as our own organization, we're approaching our 40th anniversary, actually. Um, but our building that we have been housed in for many years has been sold and uh, will be demolished. <coughs> and uh, we need to move and we pay about one third of the market rate rent right now. And uh, <coughs> that presents a pretty big problem. We need uh, at least 4,000 square feet, maybe five, um, and we're gonna have to pay a lot more for it. Um, so if any of you are aware of space that is available, um, we'd be happy to hear about it. Our lease runs through July, and um, we can't move much before that because we have to pay that lease through July. Um, so uh, we're starting to do some assessment about that, um, about what it's going to cost us and what we might have to do in terms of our own programming to afford a place to step, have our staff sit. Um, we also are facing some technology and infrastructure expenses that were not fully anticipated and are a lot more expensive than we thought, so we're working on that. Um, in terms of the impact in the child care community, um, full-time kindergarten, full-day kindergarten had a large impact on child care. It was about 20% of the children in care were kindergarten children, and um, now they're in full-time care and in after or full-time kindergarten, a change we very much support. Um, and then usually using some kind of after-school program, maybe based at the school, a campfire program or something like that. And so that has created some vacancies in childcare settings, and we've seen a decline actually over the past several years in the number of childcare facilities, not just in our region, but statewide, and that has some to do with demographics and some to do with this implementation of full-time kindergarten. Um, and we still see a shortage of infant care um, and of non-standard hours care um, and part-time care. The standard market mechanisms of capitalism don't really work very well for child care businesses. They're very small businesses and infant care is very expensive to provide and um, what you can charge parents doesn't cover it. So that's why a lot of folks won't take care of infants in a lot of programs. Um, so increasingly, families are using informal care, um, and that care may in fact be very good. That might be a grandma, it might be a sister, it might be a neighbor, um, but we don't really know much about that. We 
it's very difficult to engage those folks in any kind of training or offer them any kind of support or guidance or anything. There's no requirement that they do anything like that. Um, and uh, so we don't really know what's happening to a significant, for a significant number of kids. And 68% of Montana's children under age five are have all available parents in the workforce. So they're spending a good part of their day <coughs> out of home care. Um, and there's a crisis in the early childhood workforce. It uh, doesn't pay very well to work in a child care facility and uh, there are usually no benefits. Um, and so it's difficult to find qualified, committed personnel and to retain them. And so many child care centers cannot find staff, cannot keep staff, are perpetually training new staff and that is very disruptive for children to have uh, turnover in their primary character for some time. And, you know, maybe with the downturn in the economy, people will stay in child care. There could be a little um, silver lining to that cloud. In terms of successes for our organization, um, we have been working very hard for a long time to help facilities achieve national accreditation. That's a standard significantly higher than Montana's bare bones licensing requirements for child care. And in our three county region, 12% of the facilities are nationally accredited at this time, and that is compared to a national and statewide average of 3%. Um, and so they are, they have made a significant commitment to go above and beyond these um, health and safety uh, licensing requirements and to do a bit, to do more in terms of the quality of care that they provide to the children in their, in their programs. Um, and in our region, we have just under half of the accredited facilities in the state of Montana are in this three county region. Um, we offer extensive and comprehensive training program, um, moving away from the two-hour workshops and into the longer workshops, as I said. We're fundraising locally to support and supplement our scholarship program because there are a number of folks who fall through the cracks of the, the government rules for that scholarship program. So we raise money in the community and offer folks help like when they apply for jobs. If you have people who are not on TANF, let's say, and but they are applying for jobs and they need child care, um, then that's uh, a scholarship we can offer them for some short-term child care to, because otherwise they don't qualify and where are those kids going to go while well, they go to the job interview. Um, so we do that and some medical, res um, some medical child care for serious medical conditions and some summer camp programs and that type of thing. Our program also um, offers uh, technical assistance to providers serving children with special needs and I would say that we have the best program in the state among our peer agencies for helping child care providers assess what's really going on with children and how to serve those children with special needs and challenging behaviors in group care and inclusive settings and um, that's a really strong aspect of our program. What's new is that the change is the state um, that we're largely supported by the Department of Public Health and Human Services um, and the state is changing the way it invests its funds in quality programs and they are developing a program called STARS um, which is a like a five-star rating system like hotels have and child care facilities will be able to get a, up to a five-star rating with accreditation being the highest rating um, and it provides a very clear path of this is what you need at one star this is what you need to do to get two stars very clear guidance to providers about what is necessary to achieve a certain level on the STAR program. Unfortunately, there um, is no new money for this program. And um, you know, when we started the planning, we thought maybe the state would have some new money. It doesn't really look like the state's going to have any new money. And it doesn't look like foundations are going to have any money. <coughs> uh, so we're going to have a limited number of slots for that program. And it also will impact the way child care resources itself is funded and how, you know, what we are contracted to do with providers. Very unclear how that's going to um, shake down. And we're just, you know, working with the state as they move that initiative forward with uh, They intend to implement it in FY10, and I don't know if they mean state fiscal year 10 or the federal fiscal year October, but soon, quite soon. Um, and it will impact the way quality funds are available to child care facilities and, and individual child care providers. Um, and also, um, there's a national error rate uh, coming down from the federal government regarding the scholarship program and uh, calculation about mistakes in people who get child care scholarships and shouldn't under whatever rules the state has devised. Michelle Parks from our program is on um, a committee that's working on that 
at the uh, state level to see how we're going to implement that. I'm not particularly worried at Child Care Resources. I think our caseworkers are doing a very good job, but um, in some areas of the state and around the country, this, this could be a problem for some contractors. And am I up? Oh, okay. There we go. Sorry. Right. You need one of those green red lights. Yeah. <laughs> 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 So this isn't the room for the bailout, is it? No. <laughs> I come to the wrong place, apparently. Uh, my name is Mike Flaherty, and um, my purpose here today is to represent one of the programs that I provide uh, management support to. And the program specifically is the Work Center. And as I work, I get progressively more visually challenged. So I'm using stronger and thicker lenses all the time still in the vision loss denial. The Work Center's been around for a long time, and many of you around this table may know of it. I hope that most of you know of the Community Medical Center, and it has housed and supported the vision and mission of the Work Center for a, a, a long time, many, many years. And uh, our primary uh, vision is to assist persons with disabilities, obviously, in securing employment, and I think it's um, quite profound. I'm only the fifth person in queue, sixth person in queue now, to uh, express you know, what our challenges, successes, and what our uh, options are for growth in the future. And I've made some notes here, and I'm thinking the themes are going to be pretty much the same as we go around the table. Specifically, the programs that we offer through the Work Center are primarily four and they can slip and slide. There's like a tectonic plate. There's no even separation. Sometimes with the population we serve, it doesn't start and stop and we move to the next person in queue. There are a lot of overlapping issues and some of those things I'll mention when I talk about our challenges. And we do have a population serve, which is a wide variety of disabilities. And as our medical applications get better, so do we create more opportunities for persons who can work, who want to work, and with the proper assistance um, will be able to join the workforce. We uh, can work with almost any disability representing any population, and caseloads too, as mentioned in some of my peer population today, are pretty challenging. And we have worked on occasion with uh, sources. Our primary source has been our relationship with uh, state VR. We have had some uh, veterans served and would like to expand that population of service. We don't have a lot of independent or private payer represented in our financial mix. But I think that may change, could change, but it all depends on demographics and fiscal supports. Primarily, we're doing vocational evaluation. Uh, we do community-based experience, employment services, and also supported employment and job coaching. And right now, we have been fairly active in all those areas, and we are trying to expand all those areas, pending additional supports, funding, and all the other challenges that most of you are facing, and I'm expecting to hear more of the same from my notes I just made. We have uh, three challenges that we've basically as a group or as staff have indicated that are our primary challenges. And obviously medical needs uh, of our population not, are not always met uh, outside of what we can do and what the hospital may be doing with this person as a shared client or patient. There are some things that uh, we need to work with in terms of health issues that may impact and often do impact employment. And some may be more cosmetic. I remember 30 plus years of working in and around this community, some things such as things we might take for granted, just our dental appearance, can be a rather profound issue in presenting for employment. And most of us, hopefully all of us, have some sound dental plan 
but those are going the way fast. But that's just one issue that often is probably overlooked by the general population, how important that is as a health need. And other related issues too that I don't have time to address. Housing, transportation, and food. They, those things come up. Probably transportation is the key element. And I know that the city is trying to address that. They have done some expansion of public transportation. And it, obviously, it doesn't touch all the places people need to go at all times. So transportation is often a barrier. Uh, housing and food, just the basic necessities for uh, getting a person in a place where they're stable, ready to work, uh, have the opportunity of nutrition and rest so that uh, those things aren't going to complicate an already difficult employment situation. And obviously the most important and I'm expecting that the demographics of, of economic downturn, which for Montana, our boats and the tide is not ever raised to national levels when things are good. And it seems like the drain is pulled out of the bathtub fastest and quickest here. And we have some severe and profound issues that, that to me are quite daunting. On successes, we have had successes, and one of our most recent successes is, again, a three-year accreditation with CARF, and this is the accreditation agency that recognizes superior performance in terms of how we provide services and how we connect with our, our greater community. And we also have, and I'll mention it as part of our future goal too, a plan to move to a larger facility that will give us, hopefully, uh, more visibility and a platform to launch into other areas and those other areas I mentioned uh, briefly in just a few moments. We've worked with over 1,200 people in the last five years and in our expansion we're providing and trying to provide more benefits analysis and additional service. I guess we could call it a value added. It's pretty important we talk about social security issues and support and assistance. And I always find it uh, quite daunting. I don't know if any of you, most of you work with social security issues at some point. You're looking at economic baselines for your clientele. You need to be a near Nobel scientist in math and economics to understand a lot of this. And just going around the room hearing all of the acronyms of who we are and how it's changing, SNAP and chimes and everything continues to change and I find myself, quite honestly, confused, like, wow, there's a lot of stuff out there. And our clientele often are not buffered with education and jobs, and that stuff is just like a tsunami that washes over them, and they're just standing there, well, just tell me what I need to do, how I need to do it, and how I fill in this line. And just one thing that struck me yesterday, we had, uh, before I left the office, we had a person who had uh, need for an eye exam. And of course, again, um, you know, I, well, everybody can read an eye chart. This person did not have, as an adult, even the education or knowledge of an eye chart. And it really struck me, you know, again, the overwhelming amount of duress in their lives. The future goals, location is one, a relocation that we're looking at is probably right on the horizon, really close, and once the hospital signs its uh, appropriate papers, we'll be moving three departments, likely to a Palmer location. I think we're just about there. We need to expand, and obviously, referring agents, uh, foundations, grants. I've written two unsuccessful grants in the last eight months. And I think I can join quite a legion of people that have done that. You know, looking at private, and, and I'm, I'm not embarrassed to say that anymore because it happens a lot. So don't need to take any more time. The red button is flashing. We're done. Thank you. Good morning. I'll stand up. I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Jim Morton. I'm with the Human Resource Council. Uh, and, uh, Maggie gave me this watch, but like Mike, I can't see it 
<laughs> Michelle said she has the hook ready. All right. Uh, well, again, uh, it's really great to see everybody here. Uh, the Human Resource Council was uh, formed in 1965. Uh, I haven't been there that long, but close. Uh, but close, yeah. Uh, we have programs that are, uh, for the most part, uh, funded by the federal government through congressional appropriation. We've been operating a youth employment program since about 1966. And uh, that's changed over the years, again, because of funding. And actually, uh, because of the way that the state of Montana decided to allocate its uh, funds, we had a significant uh, decrease, which amounted to almost $100,000 a year, which is huge. Uh, those dollars went to other counties that have less population and uh, probably better economies. But uh, we don't have control over that, so that's certainly a, something we've faced in the last two years. In terms of our work uh, with uh, uh, non-federal dollars, the uh, Missoula County Commissioners fund us to assist people who are basically indigent and who are applying for disability benefits. Uh, you've heard a description about how daunting that can be and understanding the listings for the Social Security Administration in terms of what constitutes a disability. That process is about a 24-month process. So with the county funds, we're able to assist people with basic needs, mainly uh, housing and utilities. We also assist them in finding representation and finding the physicians and the uh, uh, psychiatric and psychological testimony that's needed in front of the hearings officer. And as you might think, uh, hearings officers are human beings. And if they're going through a rather relatively difficult time in their life, the hammer comes down on people. And uh, their cases are denied. Montana has, in the first application for disability, a 97% denial rate. So moving on. Uh, Given the weather, uh, you might uh, understand the need for energy assistance. We offer that and have offered that for some 23 years through <coughs> congressional appropriation. That happens to be one of the bright spots in our organization at the moment because the stimulus package that was funded this summer actually gave the state of Montana about $13 billion more money. However, we have 10 to 12,000 households that are eligible. Uh, and we'd serve about three to 4,000 of those households. So again, even with an infusion of dollars, we still don't meet the need. The other program that's uh, parallel to that would be our energy assistance program, uh, the weatherization program that is part of the energy assistance uh, application. When you come into our office, you'll fill out an application for energy assistance that that same application is used to receive weatherization. We actually go into the house look at the structure, look at the indoor air quality, which is now a big, big, big issue with us because for some time people thought, well, you need to tighten up your house. You don't want any air coming in and out, so you want to put all of that plastic up and get those storm windows <coughs> in, do insulation. Problem is that a house has to breathe, so air has to come in and go out on a routine basis, otherwise you get sick. You also can actually have something happen in, in terms of uh, heating appliances that use fossil fuel. They use oxygen to combust. They're drawing the oxygen in the house. And if you don't have the air exchange, what is returned is carbon monoxide. So that's also prevalent. A lot of folks will tell us, well, we have a cold that's just, we can't get over. My kids always have some sort of an illness. Well, once we go on, Look at the air exchange, look at the furnace. Some of that starts to diminish because the actually the house is healthier. Um, we also, in terms of housing, offer the Section 8 assistance program. Uh, the Housing Authority, Tom Rowe will probably give you more information on that, so I'll skip some of that and, and I'll let you, uh, because the hope might, you know. So uh, uh, that waiting list there is about 18 months to 24 months in the Section 8 program. 
the families are assisted. Uh, the uh, rule of thumb is that the families to spend 30 to 40 percent of their income on utilities and rent. So the difference between that and what the rents cost, uh, we uh, provide in terms of assistance. One of the concerns there is that the housing and development caps the amount that we can spend on rent. So some rentals and a growing number of rentals in this town are not available to our Section 8 voucher holders because the rents exceed what the federal government says is reasonable. So once our clients get into a situation of having to move, sometimes there's just no place for them to move. Uh, the other program that many of you, I hope, use is the 211 uh, Information Referral Service. Uh, our organization was the uh, first 211 in the state. Uh, you dial 211 except on cell phones. We're trying to work through that, but there, that's kind of a different kind of approach because they're not regulated. Uh, those of you who've had any trouble with your own cell phone will know that there ain't nobody you can call uh, because they're not regulated private entity other than the Federal Communications Commission. So hopefully we will have 211 available for cell phone users. Uh, 211 has about 800 to 1,000 resources in its databank. You call there, the idea is that we're trying to get information to people. You don't have to be low income. You can call on a number of issues from uh, nutrition to child care to uh, programs that are income uh, limited. That program uh, just received, received national accreditation. There are two other uh, information referral services in Montana that are nationally accredited, so we're pleased about that. Uh, in terms of successes, the Montana, uh, have I left anything out? Okay. Um, housing. Uh, we uh, develop housing, we build housing for first time home buyers. Uh, we also uh, provide a loan uh, a down payment assistance up to $35,000, and that $35,000 is not amortized, so you don't make a monthly payment. It is, in fact, returned to us upon sale. So what happens then is because of the high cost of housing, most people can't afford a house. So we give them the 35,000, which means they have more purchasing power and actually move into a home. Uh, the uh, the uh, success that I was going to mention is with the legislature in the terms of housing, Montana has one of the highest per capita rates of use of mobile homes for housing in the United States. Uh, those houses uh, pre-76 were built to no code. They have a little wiring. The fire marshals will tell you that they will be fully engulfed in flame when there's a fire in less than one minute. So think about one minute. That's about what I got on that, right? Two. Well, <laughs> uh, so 28,000 of these are in our state. Badly uh, in need of rehab, but the way they're built, you can't do anything with them. So the governor last session included $3 million in his budget to replace mobile homes. Uh, and uh, our organization and the HRDC, Human Resources of the Council of Buildings, presented a paper to him and his staff and graciously accepted our request. So we had $3 million. It got good bipartisan support which in the last session, as you all know, was pretty contentious and was somewhat nasty to, to be polite. Uh, the money got through both houses, but in the special session, it was reduced to 300,000. <laughs> but it's back in the governor's budget, so again, that's great. Uh, the challenge, of course, is that we have more and more, like all of you, requirements, more and more uh, need and fewer and fewer dollars for staff, and fewer and fewer dollars to get staff to training, to get them maybe some more benefits, and to keep up just with the cost of living. And so our challenge often is just making sure that we keep staff, because that turnover causes you know, a disruption, and also the clients don't have the benefit of the staff, been around a while, and understand how to get them through this, this maze that we call human services. So with that, thank you. I'm going to pass. Monique's going to talk about all of adult education when it gets to her. Uh, as I said earlier, my name is Gary Gilbert. I'm the Employment Training Coordinator with Experience Works, and I cover Northwest Montana. Uh, a little bit about Experience Works. We're a, it's a nationwide nonprofit, and my office is based out of Missoula, like I said, Northwest Montana. We serve people that are 55 and older. 
uh, low income and unemployed. Those are the, the main three requirements. Uh, we help participants to receive training that leads to employment in their community, and we do that by placing them at what we call a host agency, which has to be either a, a nonprofit or a government agency, so like a Red Cross Salvation Army, or be a public library or a school or a city or county office, a federal office, those kind of things. We place them into that host agency, and the host agency actually trains them to do whatever it is that they need them to do while they're there. So it might be in a reception type position, they would be teaching them how to do the multi-line phones and, and uh, filing and doing some of those kind of things, or uh, you know whatever it is that they would need them to do. We're gonna place them there 20 hours a week, and Experience Works pays them 6.55 an hour for those 20 hours a week. Um, during that time, about three to four months into the program, we start helping that person looking at jobs in the community, that they can use that experience to get a job in the community doing what they're doing or using that recent verifiable experience and all those things to help get that job in the community. Um, kind of some of the, the trends and things that we're seeing since we work with low-income and unemployed, we're definitely seeing a, a lot more people coming into the program uh, wanting to utilize our services. Um, you know, the 55 and older lot are on the uh, Social Security and things that haven't quite kept up with some of the other uh, increases in foods and gas and things like that. So we're definitely seeing a lot more people coming into the program that way. Um, the host agencies, those nonprofits and government agencies, are basically getting a free staff while we place people there. Um, so we're having no shortage of host agencies calling. I'm sure people calling us saying, hey, can we get uh, somebody from your organization to come watch our front desk or to come uh, you know, do the maintenance or do these things because we, we're short people now. Uh, so we're definitely having a lot of people calling for uh, wanting to become host agencies. Um, the, the other end of it is that we're, since we're trying to place them into an employment position, that training side is just temporary so we're trying to get them into actual employment and that is obviously getting harder as the unemployment goes up and the employers kind of tighten their budgets. Uh, so there is, uh, there's definitely some of that that's uh, a trend that's going on. Things that might help and some of the things that we focus on is educating employers on uh, you know, the benefits of hiring older workers. Um, they can save them money in the long run from not having to train and retrain and uh, the experience and things they can bring in can be very valuable. Uh, a lot of our participants are more likely to ride a bus than they are to ride a bike. So I'm kind of an advocate of uh, public transportation and expanding those hours and um, being able to, it opens up you know, the evening jobs and uh, or the night jobs and some of those open up to a lot more if there's more of that transportation is available. A lot of seniors in, that we work with don't um, prefer not to drive at night, oftentimes, and so you know, again, that public transportation is one option for that. So, um, our funding uh, through the we're funded through the Title V Older Americans Act, and it goes to the Senior Community Service Employment Program, of which Experience Works is the largest and the oldest in the nation. Uh, we have over 100 million dollars annually nationwide that comes into the program. Uh, a little more locally in uh, Missouri <coughs> County. Um, you know, the funding is stable. We're, we're granted now through June of 2010. Um, and so right now in, in Missoula County, we're actually under-enrolled in our programs. We have uh, what I would call open enrollment, meaning we can enroll as many people into the program as we can. Um, and probably, my estimate is probably three to four months, maybe five months, uh, we're gonna hit uh, what we call maintenance level. So then at that point, we would have to exit somebody out of the program, either into a job or you know, a medical exit, maybe for a medical reason or the move from the area, whatever. So we'd have to exit somebody out of the program before we could bring somebody else in on the other end. So um, that's kind of it in a nutshell. The experience works. Hi, I'm Jude Munson. I'm the program manager at Summit Independent Living Center. Mike Mayer is our director and has been there for um, at least 25 years. Summit is uh, 27 years this year, and we started out in Missoula and we've grown into western Montana. We serve the seven counties in western Montana and have offices in Fern Valley, Missoula, Vernon, and in Kalispell. We have uh, staff out there, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and the services that they do. We are one of 400 independent living centers in um, the United States, and they're in every state uh, of the country. Um, as you know, our country also has a balance of uh, urban and rural, and so we belong to two national organizations. One, one organization is made up a lot of the urban independent living center issues, and the other one is the, the rural issues. And um, we just hosted it at the Hilton shortly after it started last year's conference called the Association for Programs for Rural Independent Living. It was the first time in 10 years that we were able to bring so many people with disabilities into Missoula. It was very exciting. Um, because many people needed a uh, bus from the airport, they needed accessible motel rooms, and uh, 
we it was because of Mountain Lion and all of the people in town, like Opportunity Resources working with us, and you know, just really putting together a package where we can serve people with disabilities nationally and bring them into our town. And, and that was it was just an exciting moment for us. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our services. Um, I guess first the funding. Our funding comes from Title VII of the Rehab Act. Uh, we are. Uh, we receive our funds directly from the federal government, although uh, some of the other three centers in Montana, the independent living centers, which are in Great Falls and Billings and um, Helena, receive some state funds as well. We receive a small package because we believe that uh, there needs to be parity amongst the four centers in Montana. Um, our vision is to uh, educate and, and work and advocate uh, with and teach people how to uh, learn more about how they can direct their lives. And it often is in the field of home and community, but also to support the employment that they would love to pursue. And so we work with some of the people around this table um, about employment. Um, our information and referral uh, calls come through phone, email, through our website, through our action alert. And so that's been huge with the technology changes. And so we've had to constantly upgrade our, our uh, just our own equipment in our office just to, to keep up and maintain that. But we know we live in a rural state. So on the other hand, we need to keep the hard copies. We need to keep the, the general public relations and connections through um, paper as well. Um, in regard to information referral, a lot of what you all are here today and do is what we um, often comment about. Do you know about this resource? Do you know about 211? And, and we walk them through that process the first time. If they need further services, we, we ask them if they would like to apply for our services, and then we walk them through the, the stages of, is it a self-advocacy issue? Is it a particular housing appeal process? Or is it just not understanding how to go through the process of the Social Security appeal process? And so we're partners in that, in that um, learning uh, stages with them. Um, we also provide, uh, in addition to that self-advocacy component, because our, our belief is if you teach the skill the same package of self-advocacy, they can use that in another setting, and they may again need our support. That support might come through a staff member, it might come through a peer advocate. Peer advocates is the third component of what we do, and that basically is someone with a disability going through our training, and, and it's a, about a 20-hour training basically to, to understand their own process of how they come to terms and how they uh, feel comfortable sharing their experience with other people with disabilities. They might be matched one-on-one, -on -one, or they might get involved in community activities, or they might get involved in the legislature, which is coming out. Um, and then another component of our direct services is uh, this independent living skills training. We have over 25 different kinds of modules uh, where people can come in one-on-one -on -one or in class settings and learn about uh, some of the skills that they are discovering uh, they could uh, brush up on. And so some of it is simply assertiveness or uh, better communication skills. It could be living well, which we contract through with the Rural Institute. It could be working well. Uh, we have some programs specifically for women with disabilities, um, such as self-esteem and safety awareness program. In addition, we um, have a program that just started in, well, in 1995, there already was in place um, personal assistance programs for people who wanted to remain in their home and have the care that they needed in their home, so uh, that might help them with some of their activity of daily living. Well, we found out that there were a number of people who said, you know, we don't really need to go through an agency except for the finances of paying for our personal assistance. So we went through the legislative process, which is our systems advocacy. That's the second huge component of what we do. Um, and we basically helped, uh, we worked with the providers and consumers across the state as well as the state and the legislators to uh, put together a package that's, that is now called self-direct personal assistance. And so that has been a, a, a program that um, if a person feels like they can direct their care, um, they can sign on with us or with some other agencies across the state and provide that, um, that uh, service as well. Um, that also brings us to some challenges. 
Um, I heard Kelly talk about that the daycare folks don't have <coughs> health care insurance. And so when people come on as a personal assistant, they come on at, um, in 1996 as a, uh, at a much lower rate. Um, today we've been working every legislative time um, advocating and pursuing increased wages and the wages for personal care now have gone up to over $11. At the same time, what we began to see was that the health, although we could raise the wages, the health care was in such a need, um, as you all know. And so that is, um, the last legislative session, we were able to um, begin that health care process and in January, we'll actually be able to look at each agency that provides um, personal assistance. Uh, to the self-direct program, we'll be able to look at what health care insurance is needed and, and what we can provide, and depending on if they're on full-time or part-time, how we can adjust that. That's been a, a growing and learning experience for us. Um, originally, it was in the governor's budget for six months, and we basically had to say, I'm sorry, we can't give them insurance for six months, and then say there's no money there. So we've been working closely with um, Anna Whiting Sorrell was our contact in, in, in the governor's office and now she's in the Department of Public Health and Human Services and we're hoping that we can continue that liaison and work with her about that the health care insurance is not decreased, it is there and it's strong, it's needed. Um, but it comes with cost. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned before that we have, uh, so you've heard a little bit about our short-term service of information and referral, our long-term service of the training and the peer advocacy and, and the self-advocacy um, process. And then the systems advocacy and community pre presentations, we do a lot of presentations out in the community. Um, we've just done a couple um, at uh, Bank and the Forest Service and some other places just on disability awareness and sensitivity training. Um, in Missoula, we have about uh, 11 staff in um, in Valley County, we have three staff, and in Lake and Sanders County, we have one person, and in Clinton um, County and Lincoln County, we have two staff, and then we have the peer advocates that go with that and work part time in specialized areas. I think um, our biggest challenge, as you all have talked about, is the uh, change in the economics in the last number of years. And, We've certainly seen an increase in people who are homeless coming to us between April and September. Um, in addition to that, we've seen a number of the folks are people with mental illness. And because we're right across the hall from Social Security, um, they stop in and we, we talk. And um, we are not a crisis center, but we try to lead them through, um, again, that information offer and referral process. And what um, the other challenge, uh, in addition to uh, the health insurance for personal assistance, uh, is the Medicaid buy-in program. And what we see with people who are wanting to go back to work is they can go back to work um, if that's um, what they feel skilled and ready to do. However, um, then they, it's that uh, description that Mike Clarity gave about, and then you start the juggling. How do we do that without them losing benefits until they can sustain a reasonable income and all of the sources that are needed with that? So we have been in the process of working with the state for a couple of years on this Medicaid buy-in process. And it would be so that um, as a person's income increased, that uh, they would stay on Medicaid until they could uh, either through their insurance or because they might need personal care, which is not currently covered on um, insurances, um, they would remain on Medicaid so they could use that source. So that's huge. Um, I think the other big area, the most exciting thing for us is the, the youth. And we have some new staff on board that are basically, uh, they're young and they're skilled, they're smart, they're bright, they're fast. <laughs> and they and I just, I just, it's a wonderful thing to watch. And so you'll, see, you'll hear a lot more about them. They're also the governor's budget and their budget uh, amount has been uh, cut in a couple of different areas. Thank you. Thank you, Jeannie. We're going to take a quick break and let everybody stretch and maybe get another cup of coffee and then we'll resume in about 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. 
keep on track of our agenda. We're going to go ahead and get started. It's 1130. I'm a type A personality and it says 1130 so we're starting. <laughs> I can't sleep if we, if we deviate from the agenda. However, we are going to deviate in our order. Um, Alex has to leave a little early and we want everybody to have a chance to share. Go ahead, Alex. Thank you very much. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's it's really valuable to hear all of you speak about your, your various organizations. And what's wonderful is we're all here because we really care about people and we want to do the very best we can for our people in our community. And that's, that's wonderful. Uh, I, I will be very succinct. Uh, the focus of the Missoula County Public Schools is number one, to make sure that all students are successful in our school district regardless of their circumstances. I, I would like to define what that means. If you're black or white or red or yellow, rich or poor, special needs, what have you, the mission of the Missoula County Public Schools must be to pour all resources into the teaching and learning process to make sure that our kids graduate with the best possible education that they could get because the competition is severe. We're currently very focused on that effort. Those may seem like words, but they're more than words. And I, I'm hoping at some point in time that I can share with you our work as it relates to our efforts, which are extremely focused. Uh, the four goals of our district, we have four major goals. The first one is, again, student achievement for all students regardless of their circumstances. Number two, and very important to the system and to making that goal a reality, is accountability. Accountability is a quality supervision and evaluation program that makes everyone, not only in the school system, accountable, but everyone in the community accountable as it relates to their role and responsibility to our children. Number three is a quality professional development program that's focused on what teachers do in the classroom. And we're working diligently to make sure that teachers are number one in the Missoula County Public Schools. I've asked that the budget be directed very specifically to what happens in the classroom between teachers and students. And that's a key to sustainable success. The fourth goal is extremely important. We're operating a 1950 Chevy as far as our organizational structure. It's a structure that everybody in this room is familiar with. That system will not get us to where we want to be in terms of teaching and learning and making sure that all students are successful. So we're in the process of restructuring our school district so that all resources and all personnel are focused on children and what goes on in the classroom. And again, I, I would love to come back in some format to share with you very specifically what that, what that means. Now, beyond this major effort to truly define student uh, achievement, we have a second effort that's getting underway. And it's an, a very important effort that I believe is necessary to preserve the quality of life in our country. And that is schools for the 21st century communities for the 21st century and learning for the 21st century so that we can stop the mockery that we all receive about our educational system from the rest of the world. The fact that we're 24th in the world in math and science, I'm tired of hearing about that. And we have the strength here in Missoula to make a difference. This is the most spirited community I have ever witnessed or lived in. I come from Tacoma, Washington. I spent time in Scottsdale, Arizona with my wife. And those cities have spirit. And I've lived other places too. But no city, no town that I've ever been associated with has the spirit and the determination that this city has. It is phenomenal. And I believe truly that education is the economic core to substantiate, substantiate everything we believe in in this city and in this country. And this is a time that we can determine our own destiny as it relates to our school system and our community. 
And we can do that by coming together, the university, all of you, the community, the parents, the business community. We all need to come together. This is not a time for excuses and alibis. It is not a time for finger pointing. It is a time for Missoula to come together for the sake of our children and develop a system that is second to none. We have the wherewithal in this community to make that a reality. This is not a dress re rehearsal for me. This is the real deal. I came, I, I feel very fortunate to be in this position. I made a big decision in my life to do this. And I want good things for the community and for our students. So I'm going to try to engage as many people as I can as it relates to this important issue of 21st century schools and community. We can do it. And it's going to cost money to move the system in this direction. We know that. But together, if we have a plan, we can go to the private sector, we can go to the government, we can go to private benefactors and say, look, this is for our kids, this is for our country, this is for our city. We need your help, but we'll have a plan. It won't be the state throwing money at us and we don't really have a plan. In many instances, the state has given school districts money with no accountability. That hurts us. What I'm saying, we as a community need to put the plan together and say to the powers that be, we're ready to move. And it's going to cost $50 million. But the educational system is the core of everything that we do. It is the core. Everything that you do and everything that we are trying to do together to help people is the core of everything. And we need to put that plan together and say, this is it. Fund it. That's what needs to happen. And I sincerely believe in the people of Missoula. I've only been here a short period of time, but I've met the greatest people in my life. That's why I feel so confident. I feel confident we can do this work. And again, I'd like to come back and really explain to you what this work is all about, because the more people that are involved, the greater our success. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. You will be back. <laughs> sure, we're continuing that way. Hi again, my name is Bruce Day, and I'm the Executive Director of Rural Employment Opportunities. Uh, introduced ourselves earlier as REO. Somehow over the years we've become better known by our initials than our, by, by our name, but um, uh, Rural Employment Opportunities has uh, been around since 1981. Um, and our mission and our work is focused on supporting individuals and families in rural communities uh, throughout the state. We're a statewide organization, and the focus of that support is in um, providing education and workforce <coughs> development activities. <coughs> right now we're currently providing that in three different kinds of program areas, um, two of which are in employment and training or workforce development kinds of activities. Um, the first and the longest program which we've offered is um, now known as the National Farm Worker Jobs Program. Um, it's a direct federal grant and we are the Montana grantee for that. Um, to serve or provide employment and job training services to seasonal and migrant farm workers. Uh, or in Montana, we like to say seasonal and migrant farm and ranch workers. It's very important to include that. Um, we provide a number of services to participants in that program, uh, including assisting them uh, with direct placement into employment, sometimes uh, assisting them with educational and job training activities that will help them achieve placement in uh, year-round, higher wage, higher paying employment than they've been experiencing as an unemployed or underemployed uh, ranch or farm worker. Um, 
Another project which we took on in uh, August of 2006 as one of the uh, grantees for the um, Family Economic Security Services demonstration projects through the um, Department of Public Health and Human Services is called Rural Montana Saves. And in that project, we are in partnership with the Montana Credit Union Network, uh, the Student Assistance Foundation, and local credit unions throughout Montana. Um, there is in that project or in that program uh, a family or an economic literacy component. And so each participant is required to uh, to take on that economic literacy component and to uh, succeed in completing it. Um, there's an education and career planning component. And then there's an individual asset account or matched savings component in which um, they open up accounts with a local credit union and their savings are matched on a six to one basis. It's quite generous match. Um, so they can save if they save up to $500 or a maximum of $500, they'll get a $3,000 match, which they can use for purposes of education or job training. Um, and that's been uh, a good success for us. Uh, that, that grant will end uh, June 30th of this year. As others in the room have mentioned, you know, we're hoping for uh, some extension or continued funding of that project uh, into the future. And our project is, uh, is limited to participants in all non-urban and non-reservation counties in Montana. So it's, it's a very rural focus um, for us. So those are our workforce related activities. We also um, operate or provide a number of services as a grantee for the Office of Public Instruction Migrant Education Program. And through that, we offer tutoring and other instructional support services for children of migrant agricultural workers. Um, much of that work is done in the summer with the summer tutoring project at Flathead Lake. Um, technology instruction at eight sites in Montana, including one at Hawthorne School here in Missoula in the summer. Um, but we also provide uh, instructional support to the smallest of Montana's rural schools throughout the regular school year term, where of course you would find children of a lot of agricultural workers. Um, and so those are other activities that our organization provides. Um, we are a statewide organization, as I mentioned, and that's one of our challenges, of course, is that we have an obligation to be accessible and to provide outreach to 56 counties in Montana. Um, we, up until recently, uh, had an office in Missoula at the uh, annex near the job service. Um, but for a variety of reasons, including where our clients have been located in the past five years and, and some fairly substantial projects in the summer at around Flathead Lake. We've relocated that office to Olson, but we are still an active member and want to be an active member in the Missoula CMT and our case management or field staff will continue to work um, in the Missoula area uh, regularly and actively. But uh, even for the case manager in northwestern Montana, that's a challenge to cover seven or eight counties. Um, so one challenge, like everyone else we've had, you know, is, is around budget, uh, supporting especially those outreach activities and, and travel that go along with that. Um, our budget has, uh, in, in 2003, we actually had a fairly significant cut of 15%, which was $100,000 in our grant for the National Farm Worker Jobs Program. Um, and that, uh, other than that, we've uh, remained flat funded in that, for that grant over the last uh, five years. And um, our funding has uh, increased as we've taken on other projects, including the rural Montana saves. Um, we are also in the process, so in terms of news, we've recently moved our office, we've had some staff transition, which is the reason I'm here representing our organization uh, today, um, both that and because of my interest in, in what's happening, but 
Um, we're in the process of hiring a, a, a case manager on a permanent basis. Um, Naomi has been, Naomi's actually a longtime employee of Rural Employment Opportunities uh, for a number of our seasonal projects, and, and she's currently working in that position on an acting basis. Um, in addition to the case manager here, we have uh, case managers that cover the rest of the bulk of the state. So again, that's a challenge for us. Um, other challenges, uh, conducting outreach over a wide area and in primarily, or in a lot of, in all rural counties, I guess. Um, one of the things we find in rural counties is that our participants are, or potential participants are actually um, often reluctant to come forward and uh, want to participate in programs of uh, the nature that we're offering just because of a lot of um, issues, the smallness of communities and some of those issues around that. Um, we have another challenge is that we find an increasing number of applicants who do not meet the restrictive eligibility criteria for the programs that we offer. Um, and I was going to say that it's more and more difficult to find participants for our pro programs, but um, I wanted to reframe that and just say that uh, we have plenty of calls and we have plenty of applications, but more and more we find more and more people are screened out um, because of the eligibility criteria. Um, for example, the National Farm Worker Jobs Program, one criteria is 100% of poverty. Um, just very low wage, as you know, um, and we find a lot of people who are just maybe barely over that income limit. Um, another barrier sometimes is they might have too much non-agricultural work, and with the changing of the economy over the years, we find that um, there are fewer people who are involved exclusively in doing just farmer ranch work. They're also working a job here and a job there. And so sometimes the amount of their non-agricultural work can um, prevent them from being a participant in our program. And then for rural Montana saves and rural counties, the TANF rules, um, and you know that's one of the eligibility criteria is having been a TANF participant in the last five years. Um, the TANF rules have just uh, dropped substantially during that time period. So there's a, even a smaller base there for us to work with. I mentioned that, it's important to mention it because it's frustrating for people who apply for those programs not to be eligible. Um, it's frustrating for our staff, but it's also frustrating for other organizations that provide referrals to us to send people our way and then finally don't um, qualify. Um, I think my time's up and I'll stop there, but thank you. I'm Jenny Merriam. I'm the Communications Director for the City of Missoula. I work for the entire city, but I am based in the mayor's office. And actually listening, I had told both earlier, <clears throat> I'm just here to listen and um, talk to the mayor a little bit about what was said here today. He is very interested in human services. Um, and I had thought, well, you know, the city is not a human services agency, but when I thought about it, we are in a way. Many of you are familiar with us through, for instance, uh, CDBG money. Um, but we do other things too, and several initiatives that have come out of the mayor's office might be of interest to you, things we've done recently. Last year, at about this time, I worked with the police department to convene a group of people citizens, government, business owners, um, to look at the problem of panhandling downtown. And the direction that we went, I was very pleased with the way it turned out. We decided, aside from increased law enforcement, is there something that we can do to help address the needs of the people who are panhandling downtown and causing us to get these complaints? Um, and we ended up doing a very enhanced real change, not spare change program that encourages people to give money to the change jars that we have throughout downtown rather than giving money directly to a person who is asking for money on the street. 
and the money from those change jars goes to three human services agencies, the Missoula Food Bank, the Pavarello Center, and the Salvation Army. <coughs> um, the program have, has been going since 2001, but without um, lots of backing to do public promotion of it, it had never raised more than $1,600. So we put a little extra effort into promoting it at the beginning of the summer and had a um, Missoula couple come forward. Um, these are people who have a family foundation and they said we would like to match what you collect, $10 to every $1 that you collect. And it was astonishing. They also gave us some marketing money so we had ads on buses and um, we ended up just a few weeks ago, being able to present checks to each one of those agencies for almost $12,000 each. And they were quite grateful for it. All three of those agencies say, we are so stressed right now because we have so many people walking in the doors. Um, and it was also very good to take something that is perceived as a problem, and it's often seen as <coughs> This is a problem for those of us who live in work downtown. Can't you do something about these people? And instead looking at why people are there asking for money and trying to address those needs. So that was a very rewarding thing to work on. Um, we'll be doing it again next summer. And I'm not certain if we'll have participation from this family foundation again, but we certainly very well might. They were very pleased and they got to see their money really doing something on the ground. Another thing that we have been working on out directly out of the mayor's office is the mayor's housing initiative. Many of you, I think, probably saw the movie that we made with MCAT, and it was collaboration between the mayor's office and the Office of Planning and Grants. Um, the effort was focused on getting people to see that the phrase affordable housing does not mean small projects for poor people. What it means is approximately three quarters of the people who live in Missoula, and probably many of us, could not afford to buy today the median priced house. And the mayor was very interested in getting people to change their ideas about it and to become involved in finding solutions and different tools because clearly um, while we have many nonprofits who work in this area, they cannot do everything alone. And often, eligibility for programs does not address that vast body of us who are there in the middle class. Um, we formed the mayor's housing team, which some of you are on, and I've been talking for about a year and a half developing a proposal for city council, which ju they just recently endorsed. And it is a menu of tools and we don't even think probably that everything mentioned, um, that, that everything possible is mentioned, but it means that we have the go ahead from city council to start looking at what we might be able to do that would help large numbers of people. Um, it's very interesting, this has been so helpful to me listening to everybody today because while we are not a human services agency, the mayor's office on some days, you might think that we are. We have people who come in and say, I want to talk to the mayor, I have nowhere to live, I have disability, I have whatever challenge, and we do lots of referring, and we do lots of um, collaboration building in the community. So thank you for everything. Well, I think of them as the human services agency. <laughs> <laughs> I get funding from them for one, but um, I'm the executive director of Missoula Correctional Services. Our agency has been around in some form or another since 1977, <coughs> but it's definitely changed through the years. It's gotten bigger, it's expanded. At one time we were a state facility and now we are a nonprofit, um, which has been a good thing. Uh, throughout that, you know, throughout all of those different changes, our first goal has always been public safety. And that, you know, means 
different things to different people, but our method of doing public safety is through um, working with offenders, holding them accountable for their actions, um, at the same time providing resources to them, um, teaching new life skills, um, helping them with employment issues, helping them with housing, with the idea that we can if we get those resources together and, and they learn some things, that they can become law-abiding um, members of our community. We actually off offer six different programs um, that receive funding through the city and the county and the state. <clears throat> the most visible one that I think people you know, they always think of us as being, is our pre-release program. Um, that program houses 90 offenders on inmate status that have come out of the state prison system. And the goal of that program is, again, to work with them in transitioning back out into the community in a healthy fashion. Also the goal is for us to see if they're ready to do that. Um, so we house them in, in our building. Um, that building is located by the detention facility out on Mullen Road, and, and again, it's the most visible just simply because of the sheer numbers it takes to house those folks. But we also offer five other community alternative um, correction programs, and we do that for the city and the county. Those programs are, we have a misdemeanor probation program where offenders are court ordered to be supervised. Um, we have probation officers that monitor their compliance to their release conditions onto a probation. We have a pretrial supervision program. Those are actually defendants. They're not individuals who have yet been convicted of anything, but they have been um, arrested and placed in jail and are, do not have the funds to be able to bond out. Um, and or the court simply wants them to be supervised while they're waiting to go to a jury trial or they're waiting for sentencing. Um, so that program, um, again, that's a pretrial supervision program. Uh, we have a community service program. That program um, allows the courts to order community service in lieu of jail time or fines, though there's also certain laws that mandate community service. We've been kind of jokingly, jokingly saying, but it's really not a very good joke. Um, the minor in possession laws were changed several years ago in the session, and anyone who's convicted of a minor in possession has to do community service, and that has increased our numbers in a huge way, and thank goodness for the city um, helping us with our funding on that program, because we literally, that, that program, we, we've always had at least 1,200 offenders go through that program all year's time. And when the minor in position, possession uh, law changed, those numbers increased substantially. <clears throat> so we get about I don't know, 500 offenders through city court alone in a quarter's time. <laughs> so anyway, that's a big program. Um, and some of you in this room probably have had community service workers work for you because what we do is we place offenders at nonprofit or government entities that need um, work in some fashion that they can't afford to have, you know, they can't afford a staff person for. And we um, actually have them covered under our workers' comp insurance if they get injured on the job, and that's one of the ways that nonprofits are able to afford to have these workers there. So you might want to keep that in mind as economic times keep going as they are. Uh, we also have what we call an enhanced supervision program. That program is one where um, the state parole and probation office, that they're having particular problems with an offender and they want to give them one more shot, but they don't, you know, versus sending them back to prison, they can ask that we um, supervise that program where we see them on a daily occurrence every day. Um, it's something that the state was in need of and, and it's been, I think, pretty successful. It's our newest program. And then we also have an alternative jail, what we call an alternative jail program, but we, uh, for short-term jail beds, stays, um, like 24, 48, 72 hour jail stays, they can, uh, an offender can be placed into our program and we monitor for those jail beds. And you ask, why do we have that? Well, our, detention, our own detention facility, as with any detention facility in the state or any prison, is constantly having trouble with crowding. And that program started because literally there was a six month waiting list. If you were convicted of a, a DUI, say, you were going to be placed on a waiting list and have, wait until your name comes up to 
be able to serve your jail time. So the county asked if we might be able to help them with that, and so now we have our jail program. Um, all those programs, again, you know, they are designed to do a couple things, but one is also to save taxpayer money. Well, it's cheaper for us to be able to do and work with offenders out in the community um, than it is if you start locking them up under hard sales. <clears throat> and again, then you're also able to work with that offender and see if they cannot gradually come back out into the community in a healthy way and become a uh, uh, productive member and work with the rest of us. Challenges that we have, um, the population numbers in the Department of Corrections and, and in the correctional system throughout are, are big. And because of that, budgets are a big thing. Um, and the state at this point is trying to push as many people out and, in some time, and sometimes that means not in the best way. Um, we actually are only allowed to have offenders for a six month period in our pre-release program with, unless we can get permission to keep them longer than that. Six months is not enough time to get people back in place. So what that's done is we're now constantly um, putting in the paperwork to keep somebody longer and using staff time to do paperwork versus working with offenders. Um, employment, needless to say, I don't have to say much. Employment is an issue. And as the economy gets worse, if you have other people losing their jobs, it's much, much harder to get somebody, an offender, to be placed. Treatment resources, that's another big issue. Um, waiting lists and all of our different treatment providers. Uh, I'm, Sorry to see that we don't have some of the addiction services here today because that's certainly a big piece, I think, of <coughs> the population that all of us deal with, and I think that they should be brought to the table. We also, special needs, we're seeing more and more mental illness and also physical problems. I attribute some of that to the uh, high meth use that has been in this um, state. That seems to be going down, but we're certainly seeing the results of all of it. Um, and coordination issues with other agencies. I was talking to Jack a little during the break, but I'm real thrilled to see people around a table like this. I think one of the things that's happened, uh, not just in this little bit worldwide, I'm sure, uh, is that we become, with the communi can, uh, communication has broken down in terms of face-to-face -face contact because of emails, you know, the use of computers, whatnot. And that hurts relationships. <laughs> One of the things I would say is a success this year is that we've actually had some different groups come to our facility to sit down face to face and let's talk about what's going on and let's re-coordinate um, and try to work that out. We've had navigators from job service has been over, vocational rehab in the state has been over, and we want to see more and more of that taking place because it, it's you can't do it all through emails. Um, challenges, of course, costs. Um, with little increases from the State Department of Corrections, so we're hoping to change that in the session. Recent successes, you'll love this one, Mike. Uh, we actually received a grant to do some domestic violence um, stuff, and we didn't even apply for the grant. Somebody else did. <laughs> ask me, ask me if I, I think there's a new way you have to do this. I'm gonna know those I go to have lunch with this group, and they said, well, we want to give you $38,000, and this is what you are doing. My response is, who am I to refuse money in that process? So, uh, and future projects, we did respond to, um, a request from the Department of Corrections. They put out a proposal for a pre-release facility up in Kalispell. We've been working with Kalispell for over a year now, looking, helping them look at their system and talking to them about what their needs are. I don't know that we're gonna get it. Um, money seems to be more of an issue for the department than programming, and so we're in the, still in the process. We're hoping for the best, but I think that that's one of those things, you know, our community's done such a great job there's other communities out there that need all, all of our kinds of resources too, and so we're hoping to do some of that. That's it. Thank you. Right. I think I'm gonna <laughs> uh, Enhanced supervision. Clarity and I can use some of that. <laughs> <laughs> and we talked about that. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, opportunity resources. Uh, actually, look uh, before I get started, look around the room, I'm a little disappointed. I was in a, a suit and everything this morning in another meeting, and I'm going to this meeting, so I, I got out my great sweatshirt and wore it here. My goodness, do you folks know that tomorrow afternoon, 
<laughs> There's this event. <laughs> anyway, uh, so is, uh, uh, opportunity resources. I'm Jack Chambers. I'm the CEO of Opportunity, and we're probably uh, one of, if not the uh, oldest nonprofit in this room. We started in the late '40s and uh, incorporated then in the '50s, but. We've been around a long time. We serve adults with disabilities. Uh, in early on, we were in education. We had teachers and had classrooms. And we got out of that business when we took over those services, which are good. Um, but right now, we have uh, almost 300 staff. Uh, we serve over 400 people on a daily average. Uh, so it's. We're a fairly large nonprofit in the community, about $11 million budget. Uh, we're, uh, we're in the direct service. A lot of you do so, a lot of support service. We do a lot of direct service, and we're a little different. We, we live in two worlds, too. We're in the, the human service part of uh, what we're all about, but then we're also uh, in the business end. We sell product. and services to the, to the business world and, but in the in the last uh, gal in, in the la I remember being in this room a couple of years ago and grilling a bunch of legis legislator wannabes about uh, issues in social services I don't know if any of you were there but anyway and one of the things I brought up was uh, what I felt was uh, it was certainly a current issue but it had to do with hiring uh, quality direct care workers and and we were having one heck of a time and, and we're hired people that uh, we never hired before uh, and unfortunately or fortunately and in, in some it goes both ways that's not an issue today I, I still think that uh, we still have issues with wages direct care workers on a, on a national average uh, we've heard it in a variety of instances here are uh, at a lot lower wage than the average worker in a lot of most industries. So that's certainly a national issue plus a local one. We, we have some real challenges these days in our system uh, because uh, of one state agency, the largest state agency we work with, besides the good folks in Bulgaria, is developmental disabilities. And they've switched their whole system to uh, uh, a managed care system. Uh, it's based on uh, hourly rates, and you know, and, and early on uh, when they first started talking about it, it sounded good. You know, they talked to us about costs and and all of this stuff, and uh, body da, and they spent a couple million dollars on an outside consultant, and, and it was all going to be wonderful. And, and then reality hit that they only had so much money. So they backed into their rate, basically, based upon the money they had. So it's a, a, a subpar rate. Uh, it was based, uh, a lot of their initial uh, testing of it was based on different kind of organizations, not like us uh, in Haver, Montana, uh, where you have a group home and you put everybody on the bus in the morning and you take them down to the work center and, and then you load them up at the end of the day and take them home. And we're so far from that these days with opportunity that we've got people all over the place. And uh, it, it doesn't work in our system because I have a, a dozen, if not hundreds of people who that we work with that get up every day and decide whether they're gonna come to work or not. But yet I have to have the staff there to, if, if and had, if in fact they do show up. So, it's a, it's a difficult system, a very punitive system. It's gone from uh, what I consider real quality kinds of services, and I, I really I took a, and take a lot of pride in, in opportunity, the resources being a very, very much a leader in, in not only in Montana, but the whole Northwest. Uh, we do some really quality stuff. This new system is based upon chasing the buck. You know, and, and chasing the buck and doing your checklists and all that kind of stuff, and uh, really don't think much about people. So that's a frustrating thing, and, and uh, 
where it's here to stay for a while and we'll have to live with it. Get over it, Jack. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> along, the, along some of those lines, uh, some of the challenges I see ahead are with uh, the, the whole Medicaid system that we filter down money we get from the feds. Medicaid system is a, is a huge system in the United States. I think it's, it's gone beyond its means. So something is going to happen sometime. Uh, we hear about the, you know, you hear about the auto industry and everything else, and we will hear about the Medicaid system uh, sometime in the near future. Uh, so I think it's it, it's something we need to be attuned to and uh, do what we can. Uh, Coming up in, in just a month, we have another legislative system or session going to happen. And uh, if if human services was going to get it, it would have been last system, uh, last session with all of that money that was there. And if you can remember prior sessions, how some of them were extremely lean. Well, this session isn't going to be too bad compared to other states. That's good. And that's real positive, but it isn't going to be anything like the last session. So it's a kind of a dog eat dog. We we uh, compete against ourselves for for those dollars. So uh, it is it is going to be tough. And uh, I think in in order to to really affect human services in the state, we have to have a, a bipartisan kind of support of that. And so that's. That's a challenge coming up. We look forward to the legislature. The governor uh, talked about in DPHHS of, of having a 2.5% provider increase. That's what he talked last spring. And now it's down to 1%. And, and uh, so it, those are challenges. Those are tough times. But So uh, the fun things, I talked about opportunity in the business part of what we do. I think this last year, this last year, I, get, I was uh, honored to serve as the chairman of the Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors. And, and so I, it, uh, I, as a nonprofit, I think I was the first chairman of that board. I snuck in there and they didn't realize it until I was there. Uh, but it, is, it was kind of fun. And, and I would, I think back to some of those meetings and, and some of those people on that board of directors and I would like to bring them all right here and put them right in the middle and hear the things that we're about and what Missoula is about. Certainly I always hear about that business part of it and you can understand too that there's there's an equal number of frustrations and and uh, things to deal with on the business side of running a business and a thousand members in the chamber and a majority of them are little teeny businesses, small businesses, and they, they struggle these days. But um, I think that uh, we, uh, we're kind of all in this together. And, I, and so many times, the, only, the one thing I felt I tried to do uh, as chair last year was, was it's not us and them. It's not those, those liberals running human service kind of things or, you know, us anyway. It, it, this is a Missoula, is a, a community and, and we're a community. We're about the heart of this world. So anyway, I, I uh, felt that was a real challenge and a fun thing <coughs> to do, but and that's all I have. Um, I'm gonna get out of my comfort zone for just a minute and we're gonna change the agenda just a little bit. It looks like we're running a little behind and I want everybody to have a turn to share and our lunch is here. So if we could just grab our lunch and have a seat and we'll just keep continuing instead of um, having an actual lunch break that we will all have an opportunity. So if everybody wants to break and get their lunch, go ahead and do it. Me too. Okay.